The next speaker of um, this particular session is a lady who's been writing and editing for newspapers and online since 2005. She's worked um, with Salesforce, Social Media Examiner and Search Engine Land, just to name a few. She's currently the executive editor of Search Engine Journal, and she's also founder and CEO of Story Shout, the first news content marketing agency. Welcome, Kelsey Jones. Hi, David. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks so much for joining us all here. I'm sure your presentation is going to be wonderful as well. The, the bar is high, but I'm sure you have no problem in keeping the bar high. And yeah. um, Kelsey's <laughs> going to be talking about the basics of editorial management for blogs and publications. So that'll be a wonderful one, I'm sure. So share your screen when you're ready and um, over to you, Kelsey. So uh, thank you to the Digital Olympus team for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So today I'm going to be talking about the basics of editorial management. Um, as David mentioned, I work with Search Engine Journal. We get about a million page views per month. And then I also have a couple of my own companies. One is called Story Shout, which just launched this year. And so we focus exclusively on news content for brands. So industry news, um, you know, if you were a hospital, maybe you would have news about healthcare developments, things like that. And that helps grow traffic and engagement. Um, like David said, again, I've contributed to a lot of outlets. I have about 11 years of editorial and journalism experience. And then I also have a background in creative writing and English literature, which I think helps me be a better editor as well. So what we're going to cover today are basics for editors, why branding is actually really important when it comes to the overall look and feel and how people interpret, interpret your blog and content the basic editorial guidelines that I think are important for any website, how to um, get guest writers for your website, so guest contributors, whether they're doing it for free or for paid, and then how to grow your community of writers and contributors through engagement building. So first, let's talk about the very um, beginner basics of blog management that you should know. So I think to be a really good editor, you need to have a good knowledge of WordPress or whatever CMS your blog is built on. That just helps you solve problems faster, and it makes it easier to edit posts and to develop a strategy and make sure that all the posts are getting out format um, in a great format and don't have any errors. It's also really important to have a good background in HTML and PHP. That's going to help you with not only SEO, but also making sure posts are formatted correctly. Um, some resources that I think are really good for learning code, like HTML or Code Academy, uh, which is free. Treehouse and Linda are paid monthly memberships, but I know my local library here in the US in Kansas City offers free memberships to Linda, so you might uh, check that out as well if that's something you're interested in. And then there's also tons of free SEO guides on sites like Moz and then Search Engine Journal just released one as well. It's uh, searchenginejournal.com slash SEO dash guide if you want to check that out to learn the basics of code and SEO. Another thing that's really important for editors to have is a good sense of organization and project management because I think a lot of people think of being an editor as copy editing, but there's really a lot more to it. You have to shape the overall content strategy of your blog and website, and so it's important to be organized. Some of my favorite tools to use are Todoist, which is a to-do list management app that I love, and then Asana and Basecamp are also really to use, uh, easy to use as well. And finally, I think the most important thing is to be a good writer and editor yourself. If you want to manage the editorial process of a blog, but you hate writing or you hate editing, it's probably not best for you to be the head editor of your website. I think it's worthwhile to hire someone to do it for you who has that passion and experience. So moving on, I wanted to talk a little bit about branding and thinking of your blog as a business, even though maybe you're just doing it as a hobby or if you're working with a company, they're just assigning it to you because they knew they know they need uh, fresh content. I still think it's really important to think of it as a business, no matter what the purpose is. So the first thing I'm going to urge you, and this does tie into branding, is to create a mini business plan for your blog. So like I said, this is going to tie into branding, but it's also going to tie into the editorial strategy as well. So you want to ask these questions. Who is your target audience? What do they like to read about? 
you know, your promotional plan. Where are you going to share and promote the posts that go on your blog once they're published? You know, what, what social media channels at what time and with what tools? Why should people care about your content? You know, why should somebody come to your website versus a competitor or another blog in the industry? And then what's a concrete milestone that I can set now for my blog? So a lot of times I see editors and bloggers specifically just uh, create really vague goals for their website. So they'll say things like, hey, I know I want to grow my traffic this year. Well, that's a pretty vague goal that's not really going to give you any uh, milestones and it won't it's not going to let you track it. So I would recommend using a concrete goal that has numbers behind it. So for instance, I want to grow my US traffic 15% um, in quarter four. You know, something with percentages or actual numbers, you know, I want to get 5,000 unique page views by the end, monthly by the end of 2016. Goals like that are going to give you something to work towards, and I would recommend writing them down and putting them on a sticky note on your computer too, just to kind of give you a good overall vision of, you know, if what you're doing every day, if that's contributing to your end goal that you have set for the moment. So to go into a little bit more of the branding side, um, like I mentioned, it's it's so important to have a good design and a logo. And this kind of goes back to thinking of your blog as a business versus just something that you put content on. So having a cohesive presence is really going to make your website look a lot more professional. So if we look at logos that you instantly would recognize, you know, from a billboard or from far away. So um, these are all really uh really well known in the US and the world as well. Maybe not Target, but I know Ikea and Coke. So if I saw these logos from far away, I would know instantly what they are based on their font, the color, the shape of the logo. Um, the, you know, Target has the bullseye, that's so well known. So you want to think of how your content and how the design of your blog and its branding, how that's coming across, because that does shape what people think about your blog and website. So spend the time and resources to have a great layout and branding. That's gonna make the content shine. I know that you guys are probably thinking, hey, you know, being an editor is just about content, but it really is more than that. Because if your content is hard to read or hard to navigate to, people aren't gonna spend the time to get to it. So get a good designer, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to hire someone full time. There's tons of great freelancers out there that are willing to work with you for a one time project to get good branding or ongoing projects. If you want to have uh, reoccurring images for any content you create, like ebooks, white papers, even podcast uh, cover photos, things like that. And so along that same line, it's important to have the same colors and branding across all, line, all, all online channels. So a good example of this is this very presentation. So Paulo, who is our full-time graphic designer, he's our director of design at Search Engine Journal. He designed this presentation for me. And if you can see, uh, our logo is at the bottom of every slide. So that's reinforcing the branding. And then the green that he uses is the same green that is in our logo. So even though it's very subtle, it's still tying in that, you know, I work with Search Engine Journal. And so that is allowing me to have a cohesive brand across any platform I'm on, whether that's social media, uh, featured images for blog posts. That's something I've been trying to do with Story Shout and um, my other company, Moxie.Lately, Lately, is to have um, matching colors that I use in my color palette for my branding and then have my company's logo on every featured image for a blog post that I send out. Because that way, anytime it's shared on social media or Pinterest, they're gonna also, people who see that image are also going to see your logo. So it just kind of helps people get comfortable to seeing your logo on content. And that's really important because once people get used to seeing it, then they're going to look for it and become dependent on reading things from you regularly. So another really important aspect of 
um, editorial management is creating a good base of content before you move on to the bigger aspects of managing a blog, which are guest contributors and setting up official editorial guidelines. So I always recommend that you create a base of content first. So if you're starting a blog completely from scratch, or if you already have a blog for your company or you're just starting one in a certain industry and you have some posts but they're kind of outdated and there's no strategy behind it, I would consider now you know, your starting point. And I, I want you to blog on your own for about six months before even thinking about bringing in other guest contributors, whether that be from outside your company or um, inside you know, other people in, in different departments. So that's going to give you a base to kind of grow that readership um, yourself first. And then it's also going to show guest contributors, hey, here's the kind of content that we've been publishing. Here's what we expect. Another thing I like to tell people that I don't think a lot of people think about is if you are blogging for a company blog, it's important to think about how, where you can find good content. So. For instance, my last full-time job before I went on my own and started my own company, we had people from customer service, from sales, the tech team, we had them all contributing blog posts. And that was a great way to get a different point of view of the company and it let customers see you know, who the faces are behind these different departments that they talk to a lot. And I've also found that customer service and sales are amazing resources for getting blog post ideas because they talk to the customers a lot and they learn what customers are asking about and that's going to help you create content because you're going to answer the questions that people are asking. Along the same lines, you also want to keep a running brainstorm idea list. So, you know, collect ideas from customer service and sales, like I said. But if your company has a help and support forum, look there for questions you could answer in a blog post. Um, if you, if your company's built on a specific around a specific piece of software, like for instance, if you were a WordPress development agency, um, WordPress.org has a support forum for anyone who uses WordPress. So that'd be a great way to look for a lot of questions or problems people are having and turn that into a blog post. Another thing that I do a lot is if I'm thinking about Search Engine Journal or Story Shout and a question just pops in my head, you know, why do we do things like that? Or I don't know what this term means. You know, that's an amazing blog post idea. You want to keep that in your list of ideas because chances are if you are thinking about it and you have that question, other people do too. So that's turned into a lot of great blog posts for me. If I don't know a lot about something, then usually I'll write about it. And that helps me learn about, you know, what I don't know about. And it's also educating others as well. And then finally, look at question and answer sites like Quora. So search for industry terms and see what the most popular questions are or if there's something that has a lot of controversy around it that you think you could prove. That's also a great way to create blog posts and create that good base of content that's solid. So alongside the you know, base of content creation process, you also want to start thinking about shaping your editorial guidelines. So editorial guidelines are basically a set of rules for all the content and the writers that are writing that content for your website. So your blog or website's reputation is based on what you do and don't expect out of your writers. So if you have really high standards for your writers, that is going to come across in the content that you publish and people will start to expect high quality content out of you because you have strict guidelines and a strict vetting process. Another thing I've learned, so at Search Engine Journal, we have about 75 active contributors right now who are contributing at least one post per month. Um, so I've, I've had the chance to vet, to vet a lot of contributors. And one thing I've learned is people do occasionally try to push the envelope. So you want to make sure to set boundaries and they know what is and isn't allowed. You know, they might um, they might try to create branded images for their posts that promote their own company instead of yours. And you need to outline in your editorial guidelines what is and isn't okay. 
Another thing that I did when I was creating the editorial guidelines for Search Engine Journal is that I read a lot of our competitors, and that's something I still do today. I use an RSS reader called Feedly, but Blog Lovin' is another one that's really good. I just take, you know, 20 to 40 minutes a day just when I have some downtime or maybe I'm waiting in line at the coffee shop and look through the content that my con uh, contributor or sorry, competitors are publishing because I don't want to copy them, but I want to see what their standards are and I want to see the type of content that they're publishing. And that's going to give me a good idea of what I can be doing. Well, here's a couple of the most important guidelines that we use at Search Engine Journal. And by the way, if you, whoops, sorry. By the way, if you want to see what SEJ's editorial guidelines are, I've put a shortened link at the bottom of this slide just so you can see how in-depth our guidelines are. So some of the most important things are outline what the most uh, basic grammar and spelling mistakes are and what you expect out of your writers what photo attribution guidelines you have. So at Search Engine Journal, we're really strict. We only allow stock photos from deposit photos because that's who have, we have a license with. And then we allow screenshots that are illustrative um, and then uh, Creative Commons photos that are properly disclosed. And so photos can kind of be a tricky gray area. So make sure that you are um, you are knowing that where your contributors' photos are coming from because if you got if you get dinged for copyright infringement, it's on you, not the writer, um, in terms of the copyright claim. I also outline SEO best practices in our editorial guidelines. So you know, alt tags, proper HTML formatting, making sure there's no rogue span span tags that change the font of the post because if you copy and paste from Word, a lot of times that happens. Uh, WordPress has tags which don't really have, excuse me, that big of an SEO impact, but it's just best practice for search. And then proper headers, so making sure that the top level headers are H2 instead of bolded paragraph text. And then finally, something that's really important to us at Search Engine Journal is uh, having a clear linking policy. So, you know, you need to decide if you're going to allow self promotional links. If you are, how much? Where do you want them to be? You know, etc. We also require proof of argumentative posts. So, because uh, Search Engine Journal deals with SEO and digital marketing, a lot of times there are controversial topics and tactics. And so, we do allow argumentative posts, but we just make sure that they're backed up with good external, external research or uh, resources. So let's move on to receiving guest blogging requests and when to decide whether or not to allow someone to write for your website. So I usually say no if they, basically if they only care about links, you know, if they mention a link up front, if they offer to pay you and just don't really seem like they're from a brand, they just seem like they're from a rogue link building agency, that usually makes me suspicious. Um, if they talk about trading links, a lot of times that's not a good idea, especially if you guys are in different industries. So for instance, one of my friends, Debbie Miller, she writes a social media blog on her business website, Social Hospitality, and she got a uh, post request from a company that had an infographic about Viagra. <laughs> and so obviously um, a infographic about Viagra isn't going to work on a social media marketing blog. And so you need to make sure your industries match. In the pitch letters, if their grammar and spelling is terrible, then you probably want to avoid them as a contributor for your, for your website because that level of bad grammar and spelling is going to carry across to what they're writing. And you don't want to spend the time to have to create, uh, to correct that. Um, there's been too many times me and Danielle, uh, our features editor at Search Engine Journal, have spent hours, you know, fixing bad grammar and spelling. And it's just not worth the time when we could be writing a post ourselves or editing several other posts in that time. Um, if they don't have any interest or experience in your industry, it's not gonna be a good idea. If they look fake, um, so a lot of companies create personas and then try to get uh, content with their clients links in articles on different websites. So one time I got a pitch letter from a guy 
that his LinkedIn photo looked too good to be true. Like he looked too good looking to be in digital marketing almost. So I, re I reverse Google image searched his photo and it was actually an Irish actor's photo. So I knew it was a fake person. Basically, basically if it looks too good to be true, then it probably is. So if they're, if it looks too fake, um, if their website or social media just looks spammy or isn't really run right, that is a good, that's a good sign to me that they're probably not going to contribute high quality content. On the flip side, you want to say yes. Um, if they look like a real person, you know, if they have a good social media presence, they pitch you applicable ideas. That's something that always makes my job easier. Um, if even easier if they attach an article that is well written and doesn't contain any weird links. That's always a good thing. And then finally, um, if they seem interested in growing themselves and contributing to the industry um, and not just getting a link, then I'm going to give them a chance, maybe even if they don't have good applicable writing samples, if they can send me good ideas and other pieces of writing, and I know that they come across as genuine and just really want a chance, then I will probably approve them. And then finally, the last thing I wanted to talk about in terms of editorial management is providing motivation to those guest bloggers and regular contributors on your website. So you want to set deadlines or story assignments, which I know seems kind of weird for contributors that are contributing for free, but a lot of our writers at Search Engine Journal have told us we want to be assigned topics, we want to be assigned deadlines because that helps keep us accountable and helps us write regularly because we're going to you know, work towards a deadline that someone else assigns us. So we try to get our new incoming writers to agree to a weekly or monthly post that's going to help them stay committed to writing for us. We also motivate writers with rewards. So we don't pay all of our writers. The majority aren't paid, but we do offer Amazon gift cards monthly to the top post with the most views, uh, unique page views, and the most social media shares. And so we give them Amazon gift cards. And it's also announced publicly in our monthly writer's newsletter. So everybody else, all the other writers know what was the popular articles and who wrote them. We also like to give th thoughtful feedback. So if I have someone, I know they took their time to write an article and I write really thoughtful feedback, you know, hey, you know, a lot of your paragraphs need more examples or it'd be really great to have an example here. Or um, could you elaborate a little more on XYZ? Just taking the time to give really well written feedback, that's going to come, that's going to reciprocate to you. Because once writers know that you took the time to give feedback, then they're going to be good writers. And then finally, you want to build them up. So I like to add all of our writers on SCJ um, to my LinkedIn. I'll follow them on Twitter. I'll retweet their stuff. I'll share their other blog posts that aren't even on Search Engine Journal or my other sites, other contributors. And that's just kind of growing that bond and showing that you care about them and you want them to do well. So to kind of wrap it up, um, key takeaways. So know when to hire editors and writers. Don't try to do it yourself if that's not where your passion is. Branding is just as important as content. Think of your blog as a reflection of your content and think of it as a little business. Build a base of content before focusing on anything else that's going to help you drive traffic and help you recruit really high quality contributors. Shape your editorial guidelines so everyone's on the same page, whether that's your editorial team, your audience, because we make our editorial guidelines public, and then your writers that are writing the content. And then finally, build engagement with writers. Make them more than just free content. Show them that you care and you appreciate that they're contributing to your website. And that's all I had, so thank you so much for your time. Uh, you can send me any questions. There's my email. Um, I'm on uh, Twitter, Instagram, Instagram, and Snapchat under Wonderwall7, so thank you. Thank you very much, Kelsey, for a really insightful presentation. That's what's really close to what we do here at Digital Olympus as well. And so uh, we have a couple of questions from our audience. So the first one is about design, because you've touched that uh, pretty a lot. Uh, so what I believe, and that's like, do you recommend uh, in the end of the day to hire a designer, or uh, still there is a chance to somehow copy it by yourself with the use of uh, tools like Canva or something like that? So at Story Shout, I still do it myself with Canva is really good or PicMonkey. But mm -hmm. as your website grows, um, you're going to probably need 
somebody on on your team whether that's full-time or just freelance because you're just gonna have so much content going out that you need a professional look and feel for that so I would say once you start getting you know I don't know 20,000 and up unique page views um, and it probably depends on the industry too um, and your budget then it's probably worthwhile to have someone help you okay uh, so that's a question about, um, so you mentioned that, um, so even uh, in, in any company you can find uh, around you people who are interested in contributing, writing content. But I think the main question that uh, it's hard uh, so to encourage people to do that. Do you have any tips or kind of hacks to do that? Because the majority of people, they just uh, want to do uh, the scope of tasks that they have and not go going beyond that <laughs> yeah that's a really good question so um, what I did at the last company I worked full-time for is I would give them ideas and that usually helps them because a lot of times they feel overwhelmed like you said it's kind of out of their job description or what they do normally um, so I would say hey I would really appreciate I know we talked to, at lunch the other day that a lot of people are asking about XYZ do you think you could just write you know a, a 500 word post about it and if they still seem not sure um, you could also try asking them if they could just record it on video or record it on audio and then you could transcribe it maybe that would make it seem a little bit easier and less daunting um, at search engine journal we use a transcription service called rev it's rev.com and it's just a dollar a word to get your audio transcribed and so that'd be another good way to say hey maybe you don't want to sit down and write a blog post but could you just record yourself talking about this topic for you know five minutes or ten minutes because that we can turn that into a blog post um, if they're still not sure um, even just asking them for an outline that maybe your content team could fill out um, that'd be another good thing um, and then at the very minimum if you don't want to do that we also have done interviews so we'll send them interview questions that they can answer or we'll say do you have a quote um, about this topic and that kind of takes the pressure even further less off them Thank you for sharing that's a lot of options So I believe like our listeners right now have a lot of ways to do that I think that you know like uh, Like interviews for instance. I think that's a really intelligent way or like videos as well if uh, someone not familiar with the writing or don't want to spend their time on doing that so and the very last question it's about uh, metrics to measure your content performance so what kind of metrics do you recommend to use because I think besides you know setting up the process you you, you are also talking about uh, measuring and setting up goals so I think that's uh, a part of this process yeah, that's another good question. So, you know, everybody seems to look at page views, especially advertisers. Um, but if you, I think when you're doing an editorial strategy, you need to look at other metrics as well. So time spent on site is something that us at Search Engine Journal is trying to increase because if the average user's time spent on site has increased, that shows that your content is of interest and they're taking the time to read a bunch of articles another thing that we look at is if there's a there's code and I don't know enough about coding to tell you how to do it but our developer Vahan set a piece of code that tells us whether or not um, our audience scrolled to the very bottom of the post so meaning that they read all of it that's another thing that might show you hey are we keeping readers interest all the way through the article um, that's something that's good to look at too and then finally another thing that you want to look at in terms of page views is what your advertisers are looking for if you do have advertising on your website so a lot of our ever advertisers at search engine journal want a US based audience and so that's something we've focused on more so instead of overall unique page views we look at okay has our um, unique page views for the United States has that increased because that's what our advertisers are looking for or if you're a company blog maybe your target market is in the US so look and look at page views and metrics by specific countries as well 
that makes a lot of so, uh, sense. Uh, sense. Thank, Thank you very much, very much for sharing. sharing. I believe the one about scrolling, that's what you can set up with uh, the help of Google Tech Manager. So basically, you put some code, and so that's where you need a developer, and then you can tweak it inside of uh, admin section inside Google Tech Manager without, because we have that code on our buttons on Digital Ad Input, so we just hired the developer in order to set up, and then I can just uh, change change uh, the rules and so like see the performance on that and so the results you will be observing in Google Analytics what I believe yep so yep. yeah so yeah guys so you can just um, Google about Google Tech Manager that's what I recommend uh, thank you very much Kelsey that was a really really great presentation thank you for joining us today and we hope to see you in our next um, editions so uh, if just uh, uh, if uh, any other uh, guys have questions, they can ask directly you on Twitter or just email you. So uh, thank you very much and have a lovely day. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.